Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to welcome everyone to Solidarity's White Women and Women of Color Activism to Secure the Vote. My name is Kimberly McKee, and I am the director of the Coochie Office of Local History in the Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies at Grand Valley State University. Please note that Joellen Clary from the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council is unable to join us today. That said, I'm really excited to bring together our speakers for our dynamic conversation. Please note we will be recording this webinar and it will be available online later this week. You may access it on our YouTube channel or directly on our website. Please use the question and answer feature on Zoom to ask questions to our panelists and note that we may not be able to get to all audience questions at the end of the discussion today. So I appreciate your patience in advance. Finally, in terms of format, we will first begin with questions to Liette Gidlow and Allison Lang before shifting to a conversation with Sophia Brewer and ending our discussion with a conversation with all three speakers. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists in alphabetical order. Sophia Ward Brewer has worked in libraries for over 30 years and is currently a librarian at Greater Grand, Rap at Grand Rapids Community College. She serves on the Grand Rapids Public Library Board and the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council. Sophia loves to research and is a regular historical columnist in the Grand Rapids Times in the Women's Lifestyle Magazine. Dr. Liat Gidlow is an Associate Professor of History at Wayne State University in Detroit. She researches women's political participation before and after the 19th Amendment and is the author of two books, The Big Vote, which examines how voter turnout campaigns in the 1920s including a large one in Grand Rapids, helped change ideas about citizenship, and Obama, Clinton, Palin, a collection of essays that takes the long view on the gender and racial politics of the historic 2008 presidential election. Her next book, The 19th Amendment in the Politics of Race, 1920 to 1970, uncovers connections between the Women's Suffrage Amendment of 1920 and the Black Freedom Movements of the 1950s and 1960s. Dr. Allison K. Lang is a historian who explores the stories that images tell about the intersection of gender and power in US history. Currently, she is an associate professor at the Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston. In 2020, the University of Chicago Press published Lang's book, Picturing Political Power, Images in the Women's Suffrage Movement. The book focuses on the ways that women's voting rights activists and their opponents used images to define gender and power. Thank you again for coming today. And now let's get started with a discussion of the broader women's suffrage movement with Allison and Leah. So thank you both for joining me. Um, and so before, as we get started, uh, my first question for you both is how did political or how did portrait photographs and other images help shape or define political power in the women's suffrage movement? Allison, take for that question. <laughs> yeah, this might be for me. <laughs> I'm so delighted to be here to be in this conversation with all of you today. It's um, a real privilege uh, to start off Women's History Month so strongly. Um, and so when we're thinking about the portraits that we will inevitably see over the course of the next you know, month or so, um, we're going to be thinking about a lot of the portraits that suffragists themselves uh, distributed. And I'm going to start us off by showing us two particularly famous ones. Um, and they are of, uh, you know, very familiar suffragists to us. Let's see, let me just get this. There we go. So one, I want to kind of like frame this by thinking about the fact that a lot of the images of women's rights activists at the time were really negative. They were cartoons. They represented them as masculine kind of monsters. Um, but uh, with the rise of a new type of image technology, the, uh, uh, the carte visite wet plate process uh, in the 1850s, suffragists themselves actually got to define the ways that at least some people were um, imagining them at the time. And the first woman to really do that really effectively, really thoughtfully was Sojourner Truth, um, who, you know, as some of you may know, uh, eventually landed in Michigan herself. Um, she was born enslaved, um, but she became a very prominent uh, women's rights activist, civil rights activist, um, in the 19th century, and she worked very hard to 
distribute her photographs and ensure that people thought of her in a very particular way um, as this respectable figure um, in the movement um, and as someone who they should take really seriously. And she really prompts other suffragists, like two who I imagine you might also be familiar with, um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton to really try and shape the ways that people were thinking about suffragists at this time. And these portraits are really important because they're the first kind of um, challenge to the conversation, the visual conversation, the, the, the you know, text conversations that people are having that really represent um, these women in, a, in these photographs really represent them in a more respectable way. Um, they re represent them as political leaders in a way that we still think of them that way today, I think. But at the time, these were um, incredibly unusual, incredibly transformative uh, portraits. I'm just curious, how did then these, did these portrait photographs change over time at all, given the length of the suffrage movement? Yeah, so portraits, uh, these portraits, be, once they kind of started becoming popular by let's say the 1850s as engravings and then the ones we were just looking at from the 1860s as photographs, um, they remained a really central type of image in the suffrage movement through the end. Um, they became a little bit uh, more kind of standardized, kind of like bust length rather than like full body length like we saw with Sojourner Truth and, and Stan and Anthony there. Um, but but they become, um, you know, very much a reflection of what we see, for example, on our modern currency, you know, the, the suffragists want to be represented as powerful political leaders, um, much the same way that we, you know, continue to imagine powerful male political leaders. Um, so so the, the portraits kind of uh, become more modern in that way, um, but they remain a really central part of the movement, even as suffragists eventually diversify the types of images they distribute as technology changes, right? By the end of the movement, they've got posters that are very colorful. They've got, you know, an, uh, photographs that they can reproduce in newspapers and things. It, 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 the, the image campaign changes, but the portraits uh, are still central. This brings me to my next question. How did dominant images of gender and power affect competing visual campaigns around women's suffrage between white women's club movements and black women's clubs movements? So that's a really important question because one of the things that I think is really essential for us to understand about the suffrage movement in general is that it's you know, sometimes when we when we get it through some like we're watered down uh, Women's History Month programming, it's it's not about just how contentious the debate was between suffragists and their opponents, because as we all know, uh, anti-suffragists, you know, opponents of suffrage were dominant throughout, you know, well into 1920, um, and they remained, you know, not uh, an insignificant force as, as we can probably speak to more, you know, after 1920, surprisingly, still many people opposing this. Um, and just to give you a sense, I mean, these are just some, just like a small number of anti-suffrage political cartoons. I mean, this one's from 1851, representing these women as wearing bloomers, but of course, as you all know, these are not traditional bloomers. These skirts are incredibly short. Bloomer skirts were traditionally, you know, just about the same length as regular skirts. Um, they're smoking. Uh, there is a woman in a top hat. They're wearing very masculine clothes. There are actually two women linking arms, suggesting that um, they are in a partnership with each other, right? Um, even the dog in the scene is an aggressive bulldog, right? It's not like a cute parlor, parlor puppy. Um, this is kind of a, a similar image, but it's actually from about 20 years later. Um, it's the age of brass or the triumphs of women's rights from this moment after the Civil War during Reconstruction when people are debating uh, the 15th Amendment, which prohibits uh, voter discrimination based on race. And so it's this moment of really significant anxiety about, well, if we're going to enfranchise Black men, essentially, you know, maybe women are really next. And we can see that one of the things they're imagining here is that women will become more masculine. And then one of my favorite parts of this scene is this woman on the right 
you know, shaking her fist at her husband, telling him to, to carry the baby, um, which may not seem like such a, uh, a big deal to us today, uh, but at the time was this, this symbol of the end of the world and actually appears quite regularly. Um, this is a political cartoon from 1873, you know, about four years after that. Um, and we see another man carrying a baby, another man carrying groceries um, in, in this kind of scene that is intending to mock Susan B. Anthony, which as we just looked at this portrait, political cartoons by this time were changing in response to these photographs, because now instead of mocking nameless women that no one could recognize, they know exactly um, who they are mocking here. And in fact, they don't even list Susan B. Anthony's name at the bottom of this cartoon. They kind of assume that knowledge on the viewer. So these dominant images of women in politics, um, so that's, that's what they look like. Um, and they are changing in, in response to the different images that suffragists start uh, putting forth, especially by the mid to late 19th century. And there is this constant back and forth of, well, if political women are masculine, um, eventually the suffrage movement by the 1890s, um, white suffragists and suffragists of color alike really, um, really emphasize that they are these um, respectable figures, that they are feminine figures. You know, we have <laughs> images like this. Um, this is, you know, one example, but one of many that kind of emphasizes that these white women are going to be motherly feminine figures. Um, and it's, they're certainly not the only ones kind of, uh, you know, this is Mary Turk Terrell, the head, the first president of the National Association of Colored Women, who worked incredibly hard to represent herself as this um, elite, respectable uh, figure at the head of this uh, this movement. I wonder if I can um, uh, build on what Allison has shared here and extend this conversation past 1920. Um, I mean, Allison's work is so uh, transformative here. And um, I think it really shows, for example, how these respectable um, cultured images of someone like Mary Church Ter Terrell are such a contrast to representations of African Americans that are um, replete in the press at this point in time, you know, minstrelsy types of images, um, you know, images that are disrespectful and that uh, describe them or visually depict them as people who are unworthy of or incapable of exercising the rights of citizenship. So, um, so those images really stand out as something different. Um, I thought that I might share a couple of images. I'm so glad um, I have these just uh, <laughs> sitting around. Um, so, uh, and images that show that this contested discourse continues after suffrage is won. So for example, this is a political cartoon uh, published uh, in a range of newspapers in Ohio and Indiana in 1924, so four years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And in this one, uh, a woman who is depicted in a way that is not terribly attractive is uh, looking at a, a fancy hat in a, in a shop window that's labeled the vote. And she's very petulant, you know, she's very inconstant. She's like, oh, isn't it beautiful? And I'm gonna have it. And, the salesman, the man, offers it to her, but it doesn't fit, right? You know, I mean, it doesn't, she doesn't wear it well. Um, and so there, even after women achieve suffrage, there's this ongoing discourse that downplays the importance of it, that um, suggests that women didn't want it in the first place, um, and that they're not very good at exercising these rights of citizenship. So just because women get these rights doesn't mean that they are um, uh, universally venerated as citizens at this point. So there really are these interesting continuities despite the fact that the 19th Amendment is ratified. I appreciate the added context, Liat, for thinking about what this looks like after the 19th Amendment. I think so often uh, when folks talk about women's suffrage and gaining the right to vote, um, 
we kind of stop there and we don't necessarily get past um, sort of what that actually looked like um, in the 1920s and onwards in terms of thinking about women's suffrage. Uh, but this also leads me to my next question. Uh, how did broader racial anxieties impact potential for coalition among white women, women of color, um, specifically black women in the lead up to the 19th amendment, but then thinking even potentially afterward, um, given the way in which race functioned and, and still functions in the US? Mm. Um, I'll take that question if that's okay. Um, it's such a great question. Uh, Kimberly, because there is this really complex racial dynamic uh, between women who are white and women who are African American and African American men as well over issues of woman suffrage that um, has many twists and turns through the 19th and then into the 20th centuries. Before the Civil War, there, you know, there was very evident, it was very evident that there was a great deal of mutual support for movements for temperance and woman suffrage and anti-slavery. And I mean, for example, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton attends this international convention in London for anti-slavery in the 1840s. Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, is present at Seneca Falls in 1848. So there really is this overlap and these, um, you know, this mutuality between these causes. It's in the aftermath of the Civil War that there really is a terrible rupture between um, white suffragists and African Americans who are seeking the vote uh, for black men as well as for black women. And that rupture, which um, really came to a, a head in 1869 as uh, conversations were taking place over the proposed 14th and 15th amendments, which would um, eventually give uh, voting rights to African-American men. The disruption that took place at that point in time, the movements never truly recovered from that. Um, so uh, women who had been seeking enfranchisement likewise sought to be included in what would become the 15th Amendment as well. They hoped to enfranchise not only African-American men, but also women of, uh, of both races. And that's not how the, the 15th Amendment turned out, right? In the end, it only enfranchises uh, African-American men. and. White women suffragists are just, you know, as you can imagine, furious. They feel betrayed. They feel like, you know, they don't have control of this movement and they feel like they've been left behind. And um, the, the rancor is never truly healed uh, between these various groups. Um, the issues become further complicated in the late 19th century as Southern African-American men who are enfranchised by the 15th Amendment lose their voting rights as disfranchisement takes hold um, in the Jim Crow South in the late 19th century. And at that point, African-American women are fighting not only for their own enfranchisement, but to secure the ballot for African-American men who are losing it. Um, by the 1910s, white suffragists um, are afraid that if African-American women are visible in the movement, that they will tank the cause, that they will um, cause support to weaken for the suffrage movement. And so they are, you know, they not only don't spotlight African-American women, um, they not only try to keep them in the background and sort of um, reject uh, a lot of close collaboration. They're also part of a chorus of criticism of people of color, um, immigrants, and work, uh, working class people uh, that emerges in the late 19th century. This broad discourse about who is the good citizen and who, um, who is worthy of these rights. So it's a very complex relationship and um, often a very difficult and troubled one. And 
uh, after 1869. So the movements never regain that closeness. And in fact, those problems continue after 1920 when African-American women in the South try to exercise their new right to vote and white suffrage, white women who had formerly been suffragists who were white don't uh, stand up for their rights. So I'm curious, Liette then, um, and Allison, feel free to also answer this question too. Um, how did, those racial anxieties thinking about um, white suffragettes' concerns about their rights to either to gain the vote and then obviously to exercise their vote um, contributed to citizenship hierarchies developing around civic engagement, specifically thinking about the 1910s and 1920s? Um, well, I think that this plays out in a, in a number of ways. One of them, uh, to, to elaborate on on a point I, I just introduced, is that after, after 1920, African-American women in the South tried to exercise their voting rights. And while a few of them are successful, and those uh, few successes are very important, um, they broadly find that they cannot, um, that they are being disenfranchised by the same mechanisms that had been used to dis disenfranchise African-American men a generation earlier whether it's poll taxes or literacy tests or uh, intimidation or violence. Um, all of those strategies are, are brought to bear to keep black women from the polls. Um, and uh, white women are specifically asked, you know, the, the leading suffragists are specifically asked to uh, intervene in 1921 and later in order to make the 19th Amendment real. And, uh, they refuse all, all uh, entreaties to, to that effect, with very few exceptions. And uh, to me, part of what's shocking is that, of course, after the 19th Amendment has been won, all those arguments for uh, or fears that African American support will, uh, you know, tank. Uh, broader support for the 19th Amendment, those are, are no longer operative, but these white women still don't stand up for voting rights for African Americans. So, yeah, so even though the 19th Amendment has enfranchised uh, people in these groups equally, they still don't have equal civic status. They still don't have equal freedom to exercise those rights. Um, and I think that the 19th Amendment, you know, really uh, introduced some interesting complexities that way. Um, I'll go ahead and stop there, but there are, you know, we can elaborate if we, if we wish. I'm sure Allison might want to uh, share something as well. I'd love to kind of uh, basically reiterate what you're saying and how it kind of played out visually um, in structuring these hierarchies. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Um, when we're thinking about this, um, this emphasis on kind of white citizenship, um, particularly you, you already mentioned uh, uh, class anxieties and uh, anxieties about immigrants as well. And I, and I pointed to this image earlier, but I wanna kind of dive a tiny bit deeper into this. This kind of image, as I said, was really prominent. Um, why, images like this widely distributed by white suffrage organizations over and over again. Um, it's by a female artist named Blanche Ames. So um, one of the many female artists who actually had opportunity to become more of a professional during the, the final decades of the suffrage movement. And it's called Double the Power of the Home, Two Good Votes Are Better Than One. And it is illustrating exactly what we're talking about, what the suffragists are imagining a good voter looks like, right? So it's a it's this white woman seated in this home surrounded by three children. She's teaching them how to read, she's caring for them, and they have a God bless our home sign in the wall in the background. There's a kettle on the stove. You know, she isn't required to work. She can stay home with her children. Um, you know, as I said, she's religious, presumably Protestant. Um, this is really emphasizing, you know, who a good voter is, too many suffragists in this particular moment. This is from 1915, but 
we could look to many images from the final decades of the movement to see a version of this. Um, I want to show you another image that is um, incredibly unusual. Uh, so the other one was very common, you know, re replicated over and over again. And this one is um, very rare. Uh, this is one, this is I, the only image I've ever found that argues for uh, black women's voting rights because they are good mothers. And in fact, you know, the, the major national suffrage organizations led by white women never featured black women in their imagery, um, you know, as part of their process or women of color more broadly um, in order to, to advocate for the vote. This is actually a poster. It was also, uh, it was a broadside. It was published in the crisis, uh, the magazine of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. So it was published in a few different venues, but this image is the South Battalion of Death. Um, and you can see that there is a black woman who is holding a bat labeled the federal constitution, who is trying to take down segregation, Jim Crow laws, grandfather clauses in order to protect her children. Um, and so this says what votes for women means to the South, you know, emphasizing that these black, uh, if, if they were enfranchised, these black women, would become really powerful political figures. Um, and they would do so in this particular instance to protect their children. Um, now I'm, I showed you um, portraits of Mary Church Terrell earlier. And I should note that while she, um, as you know, the first president of that organization was incredibly effective and incredibly uh, strategic about uh, promoting her public image and a particular kind of public image, uh, the National Association of Colored Women itself did not have the funding, did not have the resources to actually launch the same level of visual campaign that white suffrage organizations did. It's just not, they just did not have the same level. So they never produced um, things, you know, images quite on the level that we're seeing with a poster even like this one. Um, so, so I want to emphasize this because because it is so incredibly rare, rare to see this this image of a black woman as a, as a good citizen as a good mother um, being promoted during this particular time period. Thank you for that. Um, my last question for the both of you it it get what you were talking about uh, just now thinking about questions of disenfranchisement happening even after women. Uh, suffrage was passed um, and women earned the right to vote, specifically thinking about how it affected African American men and women, broader disfranchisement. Um, I'm also considering too the efforts around get out the vote efforts in the 1920s, right, following the passage of the 19th Amendment, but then also thinking about get out the vote efforts, not only for the 2020 election, but also thinking even back to the 2016 election, um, specifically thinking about the way in which the Voting Rights Act and, and parts of it have were had been struck down by the Supreme Court and thinking about protecting sort of um, the right to vote for so many voters, primarily voters of color in the US. Um, and so do you see any, did you see or any parallels between thinking about these get out the vote efforts of the, in the 1920s, as well as um, the run up to both the 2016 or 2020 elections? And do you have any other sort of just general thoughts thinking about how disenfranchisement operated then in comparison to now? If I might, um, yes. <laughs> uh, Southerners opposed woman suffrage uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And one of the key reasons was their fear of African-American women voters. They are very plain in congressional testimony, in local newspapers. They are very plain in revealing their fear that African-American women will use the vote if they have it. And that's the, one of the key reasons that they cite for uh, for uh, not wanting to support the federal suffrage amendment. Stacey Abrams and Latasha Brown had the fair fight action in Georgia and Black Voters Matter are the worst nightmare for these Southern anti-suffragists. They are the fulfillment of exactly what they feared because they succeeded in 2020 despite the um, 
disfranchise wave of disfranchisement that's been unleashed by the Shelby v. Holder decision in 2013, they succeeded in mobilizing principally African American voters uh, and um, determining the outcome of elections in ways that were favorable to that community. Um, that is exactly what uh, anti suffragists, in particular in the South, feared before women's suffrage was ever ratified. It took a century for African American women to, to build the power to be able to do that. Um, it took a Voting Rights Act in 1965 and enormous mobilization since. But you know, they have achieved exactly what uh, Southern whites who opposed, dis who opposed enfranchisement feared. Um, and that, of course, helps to explain why 43 states now, since the beginning of the year, uh, bills have been introduced in state legislatures in 43 states to uh, roll back ballot access in ways that would particularly affect not only Democratic, but very specifically African American voters. It's a continuing contest. It's a continuing contest. Allison, I'm wondering, based on your um, expertise thinking about uh, these visual images, um, did you see any similarities or differences, um, especially um, given this most recent election? Yes, I think that one of the things that stands out to me as far as similarities go is the continued pressure being put on women who are powerful political figures to kind of both demonstrate their role as caregivers, um, as mother figures. I mean, we can look to um, Kamala Harris's campaign emphasis on, you know, constant journalists kind of emphasizing that that people call her, you know, Mamala, right? Um, even though she hasn't had children herself, um, which, um, you know, I think is fine, but there's this emphasis on kind of posing her, representing her as a, a mother-like figure that, um, you know, goes back a century to these suffragists who also felt like that, that was their way of appeasing people who were concerned that women in powerful political positions would, you know, abandon their domestic duties, right? And so I do think that that is one legacy that, that has uh, remained kind of constant over time. I mean, it's changed a lot. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, that, that we, can, we, can, we can absolutely parse the ways that, you know, her representation of herself is very different from someone like Mary Church Terrell's a, a century ago. But nonetheless, that thread is, is definitely still there. And I think that, you know, beyond Kamala Harris, many uh, women are still feel the pressure to kind of represent both of those sides, all of those sides of their life, whether it's via social media or not. And, and I do think that there are some changes to this, right? I'm sure a lot of us are following, you know, how people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are representing herself, which is an incredibly different version. Um, and, uh, you know, she's not the only one kind of breaking out of that mold and, and people like me are, I, I'm incredibly intrigued to see how she continues to, to represent herself as, um, you know, maybe some of us have seen, for example, her kind of like impromptu videos where she kind of throws on a blazer on a Saturday night and goes on Instagram live and, and shares some you know, both professional expertise into maybe what's going on in Congress on a particular day, or sometimes something dramatically more personal uh, about her own experiences. And, and I'm finding uh, representations like that to be really um, valuable and, and does give me hope that maybe that suffrage mold will one day uh, be, be, be too tired and be thrown away with. <laughs> Well, I wanna thank you both for getting us started in our conversation today, thinking about the national landscape. Um, we're now gonna turn uh, to focus more on the local and thinking about Grand Rapids in particular and West Michigan. Um, and then we're gonna come back for a larger discussion. And so before I start my conversation with Sophia Brewer from the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council, I just wanna quickly note and say thank you to everybody who has joined since, uh, who joined a few minutes after we began. 
please note that we will have the full program up and available online on our website and YouTube channel in a few days. So you can catch up on anything that you may have missed. Um, and so I'm really excited to sit down with Sophia Brewer today. Unfortunately, Joelle and Clary from the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council couldn't join us. But thank you so much for being here, Sophia. Thank you for um, having me. And so my first question for you is, could you just briefly discuss how local women engaged in the suffrage movement within Michigan? Sure. So um, Grand Rapids in particular was um, really, um, really connected to the um, state organization, but also connected with the national organization. So um, as early as 1899, there was a national conference here in Grand Rapids, hosted here in Grand Rapids, uh, at St. Cecilia's where, um, where Susan B. Anthony was actually there. Um, that uh, the leader of the um, Grand Rapids Association at that particular time was um, um, Emily Burton Ketchum. And so Emily Burton Ketchum um, led the organization here in Grand Rapids and um, we actually hosted the first, uh, we actually hosted a um, convention here and so, but thinking about suffrage in general, um, as early as 1849, um, Michigan was, suffrage was on um, the Michigan legislator uh, plan. It got denied in 1899, uh, in, in 1849, but they did discuss it. The Michigan legislator discussed it. And that's just one year after the um, Seneca Falls 18, uh, 1848 convention. So suffrage has been a part of uh, Michigan for a very long time. And so um, women's suffrage. So I want to show I want to share um, a slide right quick here. So as you can see, I kind of out um, mapped um, out Sophia, can you real see quick, it? I can't. No, I can't. Okay, sorry. Now can you no, see? No, it's okay. It? My apologies. So I kind of mapped out a timeline here to take a look at suffrage as it um, developed here in Michigan. So um, Allison's previously talked about um, Sojourner Truth. So Sojourner Truth lived in Battle Creek, Mich in Battle Creek, Michigan, and so in 1854, I mean, in, I'm sorry, in 1851, she um, did her "Ain't um, I a Woman" speech. At, in Akron, Ohio at a suffrage convention. So that kind of starts to pull Michigan into the national uh, scheme in, in, in regards to suffrage. And then we had a suffrage um, amendment that we tried to, a referendum that we tried to pass also in 1874. Unfortunately, of course, we know that that did not pass. And so in, 18, in the 1890s, there was kind of this heyday for Michigan and local suffrages particularly this is when um, Emily Burton Ketchum really got on this uh, got on the scene, and her friendship with um, Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony actually visited her home, and and, and they they had a relationship, um, and and their relationship often was tied to suffrage. So um, that was in 1899, along with the um, 1899, um, the 1899 convention here in Grand Rapids, and then. Um, in 1807, just after um, Susan B. Anthony's death is when we start to see um, local African-American women come on the scene um, when it go in regards to suffrage. Uh, the Lady Literacy Club here in um, Grand Rapids invited an African-American woman to speak about um, Elizabeth, I'm, 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 excuse me, about Susan B. Anthony in 1907. So she spoke at the Ladies Literary Club and that woman was Mary uh, Roberts Tate. She talked about the death of um, Susan B. Anthony. And then in 1910, the Grand Rapids area uh, had a suffrage float that was very popular. And then moving on to 1912, we had another referendum where um, at that particular time, Aldi Louise Blake and Clara Comstock Russell were kind of leading the, um, the Grand Rapids on, in the Michigan push for, for suffrage. And then in 1914, and I'm gonna show you this a little later on, is the Grand Rapids Press had a, um, a, had a suffrage takeover 
in which suffragists took over the entire newspaper. And I'm gonna show you the front page of that in a moment. And then of course, in um, 1918, two years prior to um, the um, amendment, the 19th amendment, um, Michigan had suffrage, got suffrage rights. I'm gonna stop sharing now. So thinking about, and thank you for providing such a clear timeline for folks, uh, thinking about um, women's suffrage um, in, in the state of Michigan and what that looked like. So what was there a relationship, if any, and what did that look like if there was a relationship between white women and black women suffragists in the state? So similar to um, the national level, I think um, African-American women have always been on the fringes or the edges of the suffrage movement um, here in Grand Rapids. So when, um, when um, being connected to African-American women were a benefit to the movement, uh, African-American women were allowed to climb up and move within the organization. One example of that would be um, the um, WCTU. So in, in, with, the in, um, with the issues of temperance and alcohol and, and those kinds of things, African-American women joined the, WCTE, the WCTU very early. In fact, um, a um, woman named Lucy Thurman from the east side of the state joined the WCTU in 1873. And so she was, so, so the WCTU was integrated very early. And then in, 18, in the 1880s, uh, Lucy Thurman, who was a friend of a local woman named Emily, uh, named um, Emma Ford, pulled Emma Ford in. And Emma Ford um, also was a part of the WCTU. So this is 1880. And so um, Lucy Ford, got appointed to supervisor of the colored union uh, unit of the WCTU. And so she traveled all over the country, country and even traveled to England um, with the WCTU. And um, Lucy Thurman even spoke at, um, um, at I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, even spoke at um, Willard's um, funeral, Francis Willard's funeral. And so then moving on, who started the WCTU? And then moving on to, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Um, but your question was about African-American women and, and, and their involvement in the integration. So yeah, so, but, but on the other side of that, excuse me, on the other side of that, so they were allowed to join when it was a benefit to the women's movement. When it wasn't a benefit to the women's movement, they were disconnected. And one example of that, as um, Liette has previously talked about was suffrage. And so in the eight, in, at the 1899 conference, um, there was an African-American woman who was a part of the, um, uh, was a part of NASA. She was a uh, delegate from Bay City, Michigan. Her name was Lottie Wilson Jackson. And Lottie Wilson Jackson um, uh, attended the 1899, 1899 conference. She is an African-American woman and she resolved during the 1899 conference that um, she, she had a problem and spoke up about African-American women having to ride in subpar cars when they were traveling on a train. And this deeply affected her because she traveled internationally. She traveled a lot because she was a, a delegate for not only the um, NASA, but also for the um, Colored Association uh, she was an artist, and so she traveled quite a bit, and she was subjected to riding in smoking cars and cars that just were not, um, I mean, the, the, these were Jim Crow cars, so these were cars that just were not up to par with cars that white women and white people traveled in. So she, re she uh, proposed a resolution at the 1899 conference, and after some discussion, that resolution um, was was tabled because at the time, white women, uh, especially white women in the South, did not, did not want to hear anything um, coming from African-American women. They wanted to be disassociated from African-American women. So I think um, 
in particular that for the most part, there were times when they could collaborate, but it was mostly when it was a benefit to the white women's movement that those collaborations were, um, were actually happened. And so some of the black women that did support the suffrage movement here in Grand Rapids, I mean, here in Grand Rapids and really across the state was of course, um, um, Sojourner Truth, but Mary Tate, Mary Tate Roberts, um, El, um, Emma Ford, um, Lucy Thurman and uh, Lottie Wilson Jackson. So those were some of them. Yeah, this is really helpful context, context thinking about what was going on in Michigan um, as in, in conversation with what was happening nationally. Um, I'm curious, uh, what kind of roles did women have in civic life prior to 1918 or even 1920 um, with, with the passage of the National Amendment um, in Grand Rapids? So, um... Of, of course, women, for the most part, were homemakers, right? They were mainly homemakers, but they were starting to try to find their own voices, right? And so a lot of times they found their voice when they joined uh, religious organizations. So women, um, especially African-American women, um, started to find their voices in churches. So they would um, join church organizations. They would be the pastor's assistant, or they would um, have um, committees where they um, did fundraising, uh, benevolence clubs, and those kinds of things. So they were very active in churches. And then from there, they started to move into clubs, women's social clubs, women's literary clubs. In fact, in Grand Rapids in, in the early 1900s, there were uh, about five African-American women's clubs and the population of African-Americans at that time were probably under, um, probably wasn't even a thousand people. So, so it was, it was, it was, clubs were very important in providing um, women, especially uh, African American women, voice. And then I also have to think about the WCTU and how African American women were able to actually get training in the WCTU in the sense that. Um, being members of the WCTU allowed them um, the ability to, 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 to promote their causes. It, it, it taught them to promote their causes. It taught them how to be political with their causes. And so African-American women, even as early as um, 1895, I can, we, we can find articles where they were rec um, reporting on their club news and local newspapers because um, there was a club called the Married Ladies 19th Century Club, which was an African-American club, um, women's club here in Grand Rapids that started one year before the National Color Association of, of Women's Clubs started. So um, in, the early, um, in the early 1900s and late 1800s, um, women were still homemakers for the most part, but they were finding their voice is what I would say to them. I'm curious, um, especially thinking about uh, African American women, were these civic organizations generally populated by Black women of a certain class or all classes? Just thinking about um, the way in which Black women traditionally did find work outside of the home because of um, the That's way in which, um, yeah. That is a great question because I, I, from what I'm, what I, um, have been able to find um, African American women who participated in the suffrage movement were elite. They were women who had, I mean, elite according to African American standards. They were women who um, husbands owned businesses, or women who um, who who themselves owned businesses, or whose husbands had really important jobs, who were um, um, railroad porters and and um, barbershop owners and, 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 and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, some of that was really important. Um, and so a lot of them were elite. Now this is really helpful context. And so I'm curious and, and maybe, I don't know, I'm hoping you might have a little bit of information about this. Okay. Um, 
it, was there anything specific about sort of the, either the culture or the socio-political environment of Michigan at the time to contribute to how um, suffrage um, played out the way it did within the state? So thinking about not only uh, potentially the way the Great Migration may have affected sort of the arrival of more African-Americans to the area, but also just generally thinking about how women uh, gained access to the right to vote in the state of Michigan um, in 1918 in comparison to thinking then about the uh, 19th Amendment. Yeah, and so I think there was this fear um, after um, the Reconstruction era, the era in which there was this great um, African-American mobility. Um, when, when the Jim Crow laws start to sh um, shut things down for African-Americans in the, in the South, there was this great migration. And you can tell how Michigan population of African-Americans steadily increased. And there was talk that um, if African-American women, if women got the right to vote in Michigan, that um, there would be this great migration of, of African-Americans to this area because of that right to vote. And that was one of the arguments that was used by um, anti-suffragists um, to kind of hold back um, their, um, to hold back suffrage here in Michigan. So I think you're right in that, and that at that particular time, migration played a big part in um, women here in Michigan not being able to get the right to vote. And then thinking about just the work of the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council, I know a lot of your members um, have done so much work thinking about women's suffrage. Um, I, I just was wondering, do you wanna share a little bit about your most, the most recent project, or at least I think it's the most recent project that I'm familiar with, the Women Who Ran uh, project or? Right, at all? yeah, so um, in the, um, so when we talk about women mobility in the um, middle and late 1800s here in Grand Rapids. Um, there was a time when, uh, when after women got the right to vote that they immediately start running for offices here in Grand Rapids and, in, and around the state. And so one of the projects that um, the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council is working on is the Women Who Ran project. And it is a timeline of, of, of women who um, ran for office here in um, Grand Rapids. Starting as so, early, go ahead. No, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, starting as early as the 1920s, it was like as soon as um, women were able to vote, as soon as they were uh, enfranchised, they started to be, uh, to try to be active um, locally in the political system. No, thank you for that. Um, I'm also just um, thinking about the work that you guys have been doing um, and everything and just more generally in the timeline that you shared, it, you referenced this and I'm hoping we could go back to it that takeover okay. at Grand Rapids Press. Yeah, I wanna show you that. So give me a second, let me pull that up here. So I'm gonna share my screen. So this is the 1914 takeover in the Grand Rapids Press of, it was May of 1914. And this is the front page of that takeover. And so did you have a question regarding that? Well, I was just was wondering um, because of how it shows up on my screen, do you, do you wanna share a little bit about what was on, what was on the front page? Um, since I'm not sure if everybody can sort of read the headlines. Okay, yeah, and so um, there is a, um, some of the, some of the um, headlines read, um, women making countrywide ballot appeal, um, talking about, um, um, there's a um, article called uh, about uh, Woodrow Wilson's, uh, who was uh, president at the time, and there was um, women's voice in their demand for suffrage. And so it's all about um, um, suffrage news and uh, suffrage 
um, the movement at that particular time in 1914. My apologies, because this was really uh, Joe Allen's expertise. And so um, my, apologize, my apologies that I don't have um, more of a direct um, response to your question. No, I, you know, I appreciate sort of what you've been able to share with us today. Um, you know, especially since it, Joellen's absence was unexpected. Right. Um, and so I guess, um, how did, so just, and, and maybe, and I apologize, I just thinking about the press takeover, um, were any black women involved in this or how were did black women sort of engage media at the time um to also help with these conversations around suffrage at this Arthur? particular time and as, as far as as far as the press takeover no but in general african-american women at this particular time were very active in the sense that they were active they were active in, um, they were starting to build suffrage organizations of their own. I think it was in, um, what, 19, 1913 that um, the first African American Woman Suffrage Association was started by Ida B. Wells. And so that was kind of, that, but that was, uh, she started that in Chicago, um, in, in Illinois. And that started to, um, to, to move over into, issues here in Grand Rapids. And so people were at that particular time interested in the suffrage movement, but they weren't particularly captured by the press. Well, thank you so much, Sophia, for providing such a um, generative discussion. Thinking about the local context, I think so often um, having the local context is always really helpful when trying to flesh out the big picture of a national story. And so I wanna bring um, all of our panelists back together um, so we can have, uh, just to close on thinking about some general questions um, and just, you know, I realize this might not be in every, all of my questions might not be in everybody's expertise and then we'll open it up to question and answer. And again, if you, for, for audience members, please feel free to use that Q&A box uh, to ask questions. I know I have a bunch of questions myself. So um, anyways, let me get started. So. Um, I guess thinking broadly, and this gets back to a little bit of how I ended my conversation with both uh, Allison and Liat, but how do you situate the women's suffrage movement within broader efforts for civil rights? Uh, maybe I can uh, contribute something here. Um, I think that, you know, that, that uh, struggles for women's rights have always been part of a uh, you know, a broader effort for inclusion uh, for women of all backgrounds in the full range of uh, civic rights that are available to Americans. You know, it took much longer for women to broadly acquire, for example, the right to sit on juries on the same basis as men than it did to achieve suffrage. Um, and it took even longer than that to, uh, for women to have full access to things like credit uh, so, did, so civil rights is, is constructed broadly to include all kinds of citizenship rights and, um, and women have always uh, been part of broad efforts to try to gain equality in civic life. Um, and of course, the women's rights struggle has always been tied within African American communities to broader civil rights struggles. Um, in part, it is the, the inability of African-American women in the South to fully exercise their suffrage rights after 1920 that helps to generate a broad civil rights movement in the post-World War II era. Uh, it's some of the same people, it's some of the same concerns, it's some of the same causes. So there have always been these connections across generations. I would agree with what Liet has to say here. And I think that, you know, we've been kind of connecting the suffrage movement with the present a little bit. And I think that, you know, as you already said, watching the ways that these, that we have these kind of uh, 
peaks in social activism, for example, with the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century, but then of course, kind of paired with it, the women's movement of the 1960s and 70s, right about the same time. And I don't think it's coincidental that, you know, in the past few years, we've had this rise of Black Lives Matter activism, as well as, you know, coinciding with things like the Me Too movement and the election of our first, you know, female vice president. Um, I think that these things, uh, these social justice movements um, just, uh, you know, feed on each other in really meaningful ways. And it's basically impossible to, to tease them apart uh, effectively, not only today, but also in the past. And I think if we, um, if we look at things too, though, I mean, if, if we think about the, um, the origin of the suffrage movement, and um, I think um, both um, Allison and Liette talked about this earlier, how the suffrage movement started out of the abolition movement. So, you know, it was that meeting over in England in which women were not allowed to talk. And they got frustrated with not being able to speak. And then they went to Seneca Falls. I mean, and the only person that spoke to spoke up for them um, in England was Frederick Douglass, which is why Frederick Douglass ended up at the Seneca Falls um, come, uh, convention. And so when you think about that, so, so slave, out of slavery came abolition. Out of abolition, uh, out of abolition came suffrage. And then out of uh, suffrage came some of the civil rights is issues. So it was kind of like, it, it kind of went into full circle. So, so, so from slavery birth civil rights and from slavery birth suffrage. I, I mean, if you think, really I, that's the way I think of it. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think it's a really helpful framework, uh, Sophia, as well as thinking about um, what Alice and Liette shared too, to have a understanding of the way in which these, these movements are in conversation with one another um, and how they're generative for broader social change beyond sort of th that the particular um, issues for, for uh, particular civil rights issues that they're also taking up, right? And you see how they have, that has ripple effects and reverberations um, throughout broader society as other changes are made. And Liat, when you were talking and you mentioned credit, um, that was one of the first things as you started speaking that I was thinking about. I know for my students, and I'm sure your students also might feel similarly, when we talk about women's access to bank accounts on their own or uh, women's access to credit cards. And when that happened, when they were, for especially thinking about married women, they're always so shocked, right? Or they, because they just didn't know, they just assumed um, that with suffrage came all these other things. And it's always like, no, no, no. We had first then thinking about the civil rights movement and then thinking about women's activism um, following um, in, in the seventies and eighties and that sort of thing. So that's really helpful. Um, this next, my next question, um, really may involve us shifting gears. And I also realize that um, this conversation, this question may not be aimed at all of you. So I, I just am I'm mindful of that, but thinking about how dog whistle politics is not necessarily a new phenomenon. I think how we call it and we name it dog whistle politics obviously is new, but it's been going on uh, for centuries. And so how do recent get out the vote campaigns then compare to the ones from a hundred years ago thinking about how it's playing into sort of fears and anxieties people have about either women voting or African and American men and women voting and that sort of thing. Well, um, you know, there are getting get out the vote campaigns are very interesting because there's always this underlying question of just whose votes you're trying to get out. Um, you know, they, they may have this, this veneer of universality to them. Um, and for some groups at some points in time, that's certainly been the case, but um, political parties, for example, aren't interested in boosting turnout generally, they're interested in winning. And you know they don't care if turnout is low or high as long as they win. Um, and so campaigns to encourage people to vote always in, have implicit within them 
uh, some kind of dialogue or discourse, whether it's in images or words that construct ideas about just whose votes are wanted and what a good voter, who is the good voter? Who is the good voter? And you know, when they, when they are depicted in ads or social media um, or you know, any kind of visual medium, the need to embody them all brings with it these, it reveals assumptions about who good citizens and good voters are. So, uh, you know, so on the one hand, you know, we might applaud abstract calls for to encourage broad voting. On the other hand, I think we always have to look and see how these ads are uh, maybe not in explicit ways constructing ideas about who is the good citizen. No, I think oh. that's really, oh. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think that's really helpful in terms of thinking about how we understand what a good citizen is um, and who we don't want to necessarily partake um, in civic life as well and in those undertones. I'm sorry, Sophia, what were you? No, I was just gonna say that um, when I went personally, when I think about um, the 2016 and even the 2020 um, voting cycle, I think about how, you know, I, I really, in some ways, dog whistles were, wasn't used at all. There was a me there was a megaphone. I mean, it was like really calling out, going right back to. I, I mean, and thinking about um, the turn of the century, it was going. It, it took a playbook right out of the turn of the century, and just I mean, they forgot about Lee Atwater's Southern strategy of trying to hide um, the way that they say things they actually just said it outright in some respects. And that pulled out a group of voters that we were not expecting, right? I mean, that pulled out some voters that were hidden for a long time, that explicit language pulled that out. But also I think um, when Liette was talking earlier about um, Stacey Abrams, I mean, even the work that Stacey Abrams in um, some of those grassroots efforts in Georgia and turning um, red states blue, I think she, um, I think she pulled out from a old playbook as well because she went back to knocking on doors and getting to know the voters and encouraging them to go vote on a personal level. They, they, they had a lot of footwork that they did in order to get people to vote. And so I think pulling back from old playbooks was the message of the day from from both campaigns, from Republican and and uh, Democratic campaigns, and that's just my 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 thought. Sophia, I think that's really helpful in terms of uh, both how uh, certain political campaigns ended up saying the silent part out loud, right? So it wasn't a dog whistle, and thinking about sort of the way in which it was specifically catering to a certain type of uh, white supremacy, white supremacy there but also thinking too about how, um, I, and I've, I've seen this a lot reading different articles about the most recent election that it's not that they're necessarily red states but these are heavily gerrymandered states too. And so thinking about how disenfranchisement has really shaped Southern electoral politics and what um, this, this the, what sort of both what was happening in Georgia as well as in other districts across the South really demonstrates about the need for grassroots mobilization so thank you. Um, Allison, this question is definitely, this next question definitely stems from your book um, and just thinking about images. Um, and so, and you touched upon it a little bit um, when I was talking with both you and Liat, but I'm just curious, as you're looking at these images, specifically thinking about Hillary, how Hillary Clinton was depicted and then thinking about Kamala Harris and other women running for the Democratic nomination in 2020, um, prior to Biden securing that, I'm, I'm wondering, did you see any similarities or differences both with how the two, the both women, Clinton and Harris were sort of seen, but also any parallels with um, the women's suffrage movement? That's a fantastic question. As everyone who knows my work can probably guess, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, right? And, and especially um, during the peak of the run-up to those elections. Um, this is, I, I felt like 
uh, Clinton's campaign really ran her as kind of a, a male equivalent of a president in many ways. You know, she had this short hair. She was pretty much always in a pantsuit. That was like the, the iconic uh, representation of her in many ways. And many of her supporters, as some of you might remember on 2016 uh, on election day, even kind of wore a pantsuit uh, to represent her. Um, of course, you know, this was, uh, you know, a very much a representation of kind of a, a an anti-suffragist of the 1850s, like worst nightmare, right? Um, I think that uh, while for some of us, her kind of uh, embrace of masculine representations of political power and kind of like taking those as her own um, was exciting and um, uh, uh, inspiring. For others, it was terrifying. Um, and I think that Kamala Harris's campaign, and you know, I talk about their campaigns because you know, they're they these are very intelligent, brilliant women. Um, but you know, there are a lot of people working with them to help refine their public image. Um, they, you know, I think in Kamala Harris's campaign and the Biden campaign that you know that she was collaborating with, um, they really emphasized. I don't know if you all saw her many pictures of like her nieces coming out onto the stage and like adorable outfits and, and, you know, emphasis on her stepchildren. And I already kind of mentioned that she, that, that the, the often repeated nickname of Mamala, you know, that sort of thing was very much, I think, centered in her campaign in a way that it was not centered in Clinton's campaign, you know, just four years earlier. However, I also want to note uh, a, a photograph that really, really stood out to me from the campaign. Um, this is from People Magazine in August 2020, so right around the time that Harris's uh, nomination for vice president was announced. And this one really stuck out to me because it is kind of the opposite of kind of uh, gendered norms that we often see uh, in, in, you know, in men in, in, in this kind of world. So we have, you know, in this picture to me, Kamala Harris is very much the center of the picture, right? Even though, uh, you know, she's the one who's attracting the attention here. You know, she's positioned higher than Joe Biden. Uh, her, her legs are actually slightly apart, which is, you know, she's taking up like, literally more space in this photograph than Biden is. Um, she's wearing a more traditional blazer, but she's also wearing heels um, and, you know, this is, whereas he is kind of actually much more closed and taking up far less space, which is a, typically of the way that people represent, um, you know, a, a more feminine representation. Um, and so he is, you know, he, he, he's in some ways representing, uh, resembling, you know, traditional representations of white older men in politics. You know, he still conjures up plenty of those uh, kind of assumptions of political power that we are well familiar with, and yet um, he is kind of uh, taking up a little bit less space um, and choosing, in I think, um, to kind of emphasize that Kamala Harris is uh, uh, joining of this campaign was a really vital thing, um, uh, was something that really made people excited, made their base um, excited, um, and that you know I think this image kind of really uh, propels her forward as like. Um, a, a future for the party in a way that that he is kind of uh, uh, much more passive and, and kind of taking a step back, um, which is something that um, you know he has articulated that that he wants her to to be be a really particularly active vice presidential figure, and I think that that's represented here. So that was that was just one of the images that really stood out to me um, as a as a really unusual image to come out of that particular campaign. Thanks so much for sharing that. I appreciate that. And it leads me to sort of some of my own questions I've been thinking about through this uh, conversation with all of you. Um, and so when we talk about sort of these visual images and just vi visual literacy in general, right? So thinking about our own consumption of media, um, why do you guys, why do you all think that this imagery is still so powerful and still plays a role in our political life. So not just thinking about these positive representations, but also thinking about the way in which media has been used to denigrate some political figures as well. I think images are actually even more part of our daily life than they were 150 years ago. Uh, you know, 
how many of us have already checked Instagram today? How many of us have scrolled through Twitter and, you know, which tweets get the most interest is ones with images attached or, you know, some form of visual component of it, right? It, it's, um, it, it, it's something that we consume on an even greater scale <laughs> than our uh, ancestors did. Um, and yet, as you note, a lot of the conventions, a lot of the norms around um, what images are popular, how we expect our, for example, political figures to be represented, how we expect to make fun of political figures, that has surprisingly changed very little. Um, and what, you know, for example, with how people critique women in power as, you know, these masculine aggressive figures, that's still an incredibly common thread, even if it's represented in slightly different ways. Like we don't have the the man carrying a baby phenomenon in a political cartoon in the same way that we did in the 1870s. And yet, I guarantee you that um, some people looked at the photograph I just showed of Joe Biden wearing a mask, which was, you know, something that people were kind of putting, uh, uh, mocking as feminized, uh, you know, not masculine, not, not you know, powerful, uh, strong enough. Um, so, so, so those kinds of critiques are still with us. And I think that one of the differences between looking at those images in 1850 and looking at these images in 2021 is that they are so part of our culture, we barely consciously realize them as we're like scrolling through Instagram. They are not, at, whereas in 1850, if you were to open up an illustrated newspaper, they would often have, uh, you know, the, the first illustrated newspapers ever, right? They would often have, you know, text describing what's going on in the image, what they want you to pay attention to, what it kind of signifies. But in 2021, those things are just so ingrained in us that um, one of the problems I think we have is that we often don't critically analyze, critically engage and question like the conversations that are happening visually constantly. I would just, uh, you know, make this small contribution to what Allison has laid out so well there. And that is the, I think the reason that there are these um, continuities is because there continue to be this co these contestations. You know, there continues to be uh, debate about the role of women in public life. There continues to be debate about um, racial equity and equality. I mean, the issues have evolved, but the, the hierarchies are still contested. And so, you know, we do see the longevity of these ways of representing those kinds of differences and hierarchies. Um, you know, the issues aren't settled and the visual language that's used to communicate these ideas reflects that. So we did receive an audience question and it's similar to sort of our thread along images. Um, and so um, the audience member asks, would, given Allison's reading of Kamala Harris's photo, would anyone care to comment on the Vogue magazine controversy of, about the covers of our new vice president? I would just say that I agree with the criticism. I mean, as soon as I saw that photograph, um, on the one hand, uh, I think that one of the goals of the photograph was to make Kamala Harris appear approachable in a way, um, which I think is something that a lot of politicians strive for. They want to give you the sense that even though you will likely never meet them, uh, that, that if you did, you would be able to say hi, and how's it going, that sort of thing, I think is really something that politicians value and that voters often value. And yet, um, as a lot of critique critics pointed out, correctly, um, that was not the kind of uh, powerful representation of our very first female vice president, a black woman, you know, that, that we, a black and Asian woman, right, that we should have had um, on, on the cover of the magazine. When you compare it to other representations of women like Beyonce and, and, and so forth, um, that if you do a quick Google, you can kind of like see kind of these, these images kind of placed next to each other. Um, I think that that controversy just tells us um, how um, how contested these representations of women in public still are. So that's a great question. Yeah, and I would, uh, you know, again, just uh, amplify maybe a slightly different angle to it. 
I think it was very much a part of the politics of backlash. You know, when women achieve things, when people of color achieve things, there are cultural responses that undermine the importance or the value um, or the, um, or the uh, exceptional, you know, the, the achievement of those kinds of changes. You know, there is, it was very much this kind of opening salvo in a battle to make the very great thing that she has achieved, not as important, not as exceptional, um, and not as consequential. I think that's really helpful um, in terms of how we interpret both the image itself, but also the conversations happening afterward about an image too. And so as we close this conversation, um, I'm hoping all three of you might be able to answer this next question or actually my last question. Um, either do you, are there any particular resources that people that you can recommend for people to learn more both either about the run up and after of the um, to women's suffrage and then sort of immediately after, but also thinking about what are you hoping that if I was just a regular audience member and not moderating this wonderful conversation with you all, what is something that you know I should be walking away with or people listening um, to the recording? What should they walk away from with from today's conversation? Um, well, I would hope that one takeaway is that um, uh, to, to paraphrase William Faulkner, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. Uh, because, you know, we see the, we see these continuities, it's, it doesn't mean that there isn't change. Um, there certainly has been change and we should not diminish the, the magnitude of the accomplishments of women's suffrage, the accomplishments of the Voting Rights Act, the accomplishments of Stacey Abrams and Black Voters Matters, and the accomplishments of someone like Hillary Clinton or uh, Kamala Harris. But uh, we should we should be aware that uh, that these contestations continue, that they use language and images and tactics from the past that have been updated and adapted in interesting ways. And, um, you know, the, the problems that we contend with today are, are not new. And um, the solutions uh, likewise can, can draw from strategies and tactics and language of the past. I think that what Liette has to say is exactly correct, right? So continuing to emphasize the ways that these uh, conversations are um, very much built on past conversations about social justice and equity. And um, I actually just pulled together a few links that I'd love to throw in the chat for people who are interested in learning more. Uh, one is uh, a documentary that came out this, uh, this past summer called The Vote, um, which has uh, wonderful interviews with, with wonderful scholars and tells a really interesting story about suffrage in the 1910s. Um, and it even has some amazing uh, footage that I even I had never seen of, of suffrage parades and things that I thought was really fantastic. Um, another one is a podcast that is actually hosted by um, Retta and Rosario Dawson and tells a really love, uh, you know, great history um, of the suffrage movement. Um, another is a website that, to be, to be honest, I, I curated and wrote the text for, and it's called Truth Be Told, Stories of Black Women's Fight for the Vote, which tells kind of a, a high-level overview with a few primary sources about um, the fight for uh, voting rights, particularly by Black women. And if you're interested in finding some more of these primary sources, by and about Black women and the suffrage movement. Uh, the Digital Public Library of America actually created and uh, a new collection that is, you know, they're still adding things to um, that is specifically focused on Black women and the suffrage movement. And they are actually even um, paying to have new papers digitized at, at archives that are often under-resourced um, at, at places like 
um, HBCUs. Um, so, so these are going to, I expect, uh, transform, continue to transform the story about the suffrage movement um, in ways uh, in, in, for the years to come. So those are some resources that I would recommend checking out. So um, I, I first of all want to apologize for um, fumbling so much in the beginning. I just was not prepared to um, speak on some of the things Joellen and I had divided um, our topics up. And so this morning I was racing, trying to get some, um, to, to refresh my memory on things that she was going to cover. So, um, but uh, Grand Rapids has a really, really rich history in suffrage. In fact, I want to show um, share my screen because the link is already in the chat for um, the, the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council's webpage, but I want to share my page to show you we created um, a timeline of suffrage in, um, in, can you all see that? A timeline of suffrage in Michigan in which I would love for you to visit um, this timeline and if you just click on any of the things it'll take you to um, the timeline and um, it'll open up for you. Let me see if I can get it to open. And you, you're able to kind of um, um, wave through the timeline. It's taken a minute to load, but um, when you have time, go ahead and take a look at that because we do have a rich history and there were, um, and, and I, I was really surprised to learn and um, really, um, proud to learn how often and how much participation um, there was in public speaking and public life for African American women here in Grand Rapids, including um, all of the clubs and stuff that were um, open and um, available for African American women to exercise their voice uh, here in Grand Rapids. And I appreciate both Allison and Liette for sharing um, their information with us as well. And thank you, Kimberly, for hosting and Grand Valley for hosting. If I may well, add I just, just may oh, I, sure. May I add just one more thing? Um, I want to thank Sophia for doing a marvelous job of uh, making uh, Grand Rapids women's history much more transparent to us. And I'd also like to give a shout out to the uh, Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council which I have had some contact with over two decades. And I am not aware of a locally based women's history organization that is, you know, that does more than they do. Their web pages are incredible. The resources that they've made available through the Grand Rapids Public Library and elsewhere are part of the reason that I focused part of my first book in Grand Rapids. Um, you know, there is a long history of caring about history among the women of Grand Rapids. And I see the women who continue this work today as really people who are continuing the work of Grand Rapids suffragists, many of whom went on to become leaders in the national suffrage movement later. So Grand Rapids is doing great work. Thank you for that. No, I also just wanna say, Sophia, I so appreciate you being able to tell the story of Grand Rapids and women's contributions from the area to both the, the local state and national levels. I think it's it's a really important story. Um, and the resources that the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council have curated and participated in, you know, it, it's amazing to see, and especially given um, the digitization of so many different kinds of ephemera um, and pulling them together to create um, these broader narratives and interventions. And so I just wanna go ahead and thank all of you uh, for being here today and being in conversation. This has been such a fun time for me. Um, and just a reminder to folks, thank you again uh, for coming. And if you did arrive a little bit late, no worries. This will be up on our YouTube channel as well as our website by the end of the week. So make sure you check that out. And again, I just wanna say thank you to Allison, Sophia and Liat for joining me today. It was a lot of fun for me. I feel like I've, I've learned so much, but also you gave me a lot of things to reflect upon and new resources to check out. So thank you. And I hope everybody has a great start to Women's History Month and have a great March. Bye.